welcome once again to this section of Vinicius Cast, created with the purpose of informing, analyzing, conversing, and discussing in a natural and censored way each and every one of the political and social events that happen in society. Also, we would like to say thank you to all our audience and students for tuning in and for their preference for our channel, Inisec Cast. Today, we have a really special guest, Lieutenant Colonel Heiner Brockerman. He had a PhD, an AA section, had a deputy head of the education department of the Bundeswehr Center for Military History and Social Sciences in Postman, Germany. He is professor at the University of Postman, professor of the war studies, and elected member of the German branch of International Commission on Military History, and who has an incredible and extensive professional background in military history. So, Lieutenant Colonel Heine Brockenmann, welcome to our channel. It's a pleasure for us to have you here today in Inisekas. It's a pleasure for me too. <laughs> hey, we would talk about the professional career of Lieutenant Colonel, of course, and his extensive experience as an expert in military history. So, Colonel, tell us about your work in the Education Department at the Bundeswehr Center for Military History and Social Sciences. In uh, our branch of uh, historical education, we are preparing uh, history books for teachers of the Bundeswehr and also for uh, every officers who are uh, teaching political history or politics inside the military. So we uh, are responsible for the historical part of uh, total uh, ex uh, education of the German armed forces. And for this, we are preparing uh, history books for officers. For example, this one is a history book for officers, initial training, military history. And we are also making uh, journals. For example, this is our history journal, military history. It's made for officers, for sergeants, for normal soldiers who, who like to read military history. And uh, we even try to uh, try to, to, to give to every soldier these informations about uh, pastime wars and uh, operations and uh, even political uh, uh, in, uh, history of, uh, of wars from the medieval ages on, until now. For example, we have a series of books of modern wars uh, of the 18th century. It's a book and another book is of the Second World War what everybody would expect from Germans. And we have also uh, in this series, a book on the Kosovo War of 1990, because we want to, uh, want to cover all the military history uh, on this level from uh, basic knowledge up to knowledge for specialists who, who are carrying on uh, nearly every question on history. But mostly um, we think without history, a soldier cannot do his job. Excellent, and have a great expert in military history. I have a question for that. What gave rise to the World War II? Very difficult question. And so yeah. I think a lot of our students uh, have a good impression what led to the Second World War. Uh, most of people said, okay, this was the First World War. What followed after the First World War? These ideas of uh, um, perhaps... Uh, Re, re, uh, re, return to a situation before the Treaty of Versailles. And, uh, but in my opinion, it's uh, this uh, problem of uh, this uh, German state inside Europe with this idea that uh, they will have to yeah, reconquer everything they lost after the First World War. And uh, even this idea of uh, national socialism, which uh, put Germany overall in Europe and forgot that it should be a, uh, perhaps a new idea, it should be normal to be part of uh, European states. And uh, after all, the main problem was Hitler and his Nazi party in this way towards the Second World War. It's uh, perhaps yeah. a difference between the first war and the second war. Um, the first war, a lot of people think, okay, there were 
several states with, with have several have had a part of uh, fault in this beginning. Uh, a lot of people read the book of Christopher Clark, the uh, Sleepwalkers, and uh, but the Second World War, uh, in our view, is uh, it's the fault of Germany. I, I totally agree with that. About the World War II that you know brought with a worldwide political consequences and that you know on June 22, 1944, Hitler's Germany launched Operation, Operation Barbarossa that was a major offensive against the Soviet Union then commanded by Joseph Stalin. But what were the German objectives and were they really main for a totally conquest of the USSR. The idea to, to have war with Soviet Russia, it was an idea really from, really from the beginning of uh, Hitler's, uh, Hitler's reign. And uh, the Wehrmacht uh, prepared this war from the 1930s on. And uh, this idea was to quick, uh, in, in a quick finish a war against this uh, this country uh, the idea was perhaps in the summer gain the situation where where russia is on this down and uh, this uh, idea perhaps was developed by the german general staff they thought okay th thinking of the first world war where germany won the war against russia and after the the peace treaty uh, was able to march deep into Russia up to the Caucasus in the last day of the First World War, they thought, okay, we can try and perhaps it works. And so they uh, tried with uh, three big columns to, to, to attack Russia from the Baltic Sea up to the, the, the Black Sea and uh, with about more than a million soldiers. And uh, this led to some uh, battles where they had uh, really uh, operational uh, victories. But in the end, the winter came and the German army wasn't prepared for winter. They had all their summer uniforms, for example, and they stopped uh, that just at the outskirts of Moscow. And so uh, after several months, they had victory after victory, but there was no decision. And in this situation, Hitler decided to change directions. So heading south to uh, the Black Sea, to the Caucasus, and on the other side, heading north to siege Leningrad. And uh, in the middle, they kind of uh, stop off this attack against Moscow. And this war lasts several years. And uh, the final decision didn't came. And everyone knew uh, battles like Stalingrad, which uh, should be uh, uh, the turning point of the Second World War. But when you see Stalingrad, the war lasts a lot, a lot, a lot after Stalingrad. And uh, uh, when you see what Germany had in uh, 1944, when several officers tried to kill Hitler, most of the German soldiers died after July 1944 in this last phase of the Second World War from July 1944 up to May 1945. Most of the uh, German soldiers of the Second World War died. There you can see what fierce war it was and uh, how long it lasts and that finally the war was uh, lost in the East and also in the West with this uh, war in Normandy and also in Italy where uh, the Allied powers stopped their attack but uh, gained a lot of Italy and then you have this uh, uh, attack against this fortress of Europe where Germany lost this war definitely and this is perhaps a difference uh, in the feeling of the German people in the First World War uh, nearly nothing of Germany was conquered and in the Second World War ended with a total defeat of the German Empire. 
you know uh, something and some phrases that is really very important about the Russian winter and how the CISAF uh, was the Russian winter in the Battle of Moscow? Um, the Russian winter was very decisive, but uh, in the end, it was the planning of this war who led to this failure uh, at the gates of Moscow. Uh, starting a war against Russia, against the state which is well known for its winter, uh, starting a war without winter uniforms, without machinery which is capable to, to work under really hard uh, climate situations. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of uh, bad planning and it's perhaps a little bit more because uh, the problems were well known in Germany and uh, it could be seen even in half, uh, also after the summer, you have this period of mud where it was very moisty in, in, in the ways uh, when we have dusty roads and they changed into mud roads and uh, in the end, in the mud, the, the, the tanks and the people really freeze uh, during several hours when the winter came with all its force. And then uh, the Stalin introduced his uh, Siberian division, divisions in the defense of Moscow and uh, they were well equipped and they had this uh, even morale effect that they are defending Moscow, the capital of this country. And I think uh, uh, all what the Germans did on their way to Moscow and it was what, what was known, uh, all uh, even the uh, criminal way they, they tr treated with uh, the Russian people uh, and also these, uh, for example, for the commissars, uh, the political officers of the Soviet army, this was well known and uh, the people had a real fear, not only they are not only fearing Stalin <laughs> to force them, they are also fearing the Germans. And uh, in those times, uh, the German had this idea to conquer a country, to uh, enslave the population, that the Slavic people shouldn't live like the normal inhabitants of the country. They should work and perhaps they should vanish. And Hitler uh, had this idea of Germanization of this real very big country to have a super German nation. And the people realized it. And on the other side, Stalin was at this at this point of this battle, he was uh, right um, back in the saddle, so to say. The first, uh, the first um, uh, problems with leading the Soviet army, I think that changed all after this battle of Moscow, this first, very first uh, victory uh, against the Germans. And this was in a way the first decisive victory, because after this, they knew, okay, we can beat the Germans before Moscow. We haven't uh, retreat up to the Ural. We can be, uh, we can stand in, uh, in the, at the face against the German armies. This was, I think, Moscow had a very big effect. And even for the world, because uh, other states like Britain or the United States, they realized the Germans could be stopped. And perhaps this, the war could end in favor for the Allies. It's true. But would it be said or would it be correct to say that Stanley was an impediment to the Soviet defense? Yes and no, I would say. Yes and no, because first Stalin uh, was responsible for a kind of... Uh, uh, cl cleansing of uh, the elites of the Soviet Union during the 1930s. And so uh, in this uh, series of uh, uh, very hard uh, oppressing the population, the, the, sol the soldiers or the top soldiers were killed like Marshal Tukhachevsky and others. Others were beaten, really beaten up like uh, Marshal Rokossovsky who I think he lost all his teeth during torture by the secret service. And these were his, his generals where he wanted to, to beat Hitler. And in a way, he, uh, he, was, uh, he was himself a problem of his own army. But after all, he was a dictator. 
he was a, a mass murderer in a way, and the people feared him very much. And so on the one side, he had this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, fighting against his own army in the 1930s. And on the other side, they feared him and he was with his heart uh, oppressing uh, reign he he was uh, organizing this uh, fight against germany and uh, i think hitler hitler did something with his kind of war that uh, stalin made uh, or gave stalin the possibility to recall this napoleonic era when he said, we are leading a war of the fatherland or of the motherland, as the Russians said, we are defending our nations against uh, Hitler, like against uh, Napoleon. And this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, the re-motivation uh, of uh, the Russian people by this idea of the uh, defense of the fatherland and the terror of Stalin and uh, the terror of the Germans, I think, uh, is there are several ways which uh, which led to this uh, very uh, very uh, impressive defense of the Soviet Union at last? But they lost so many people. They lost uh, millions of people uh, during this war. And uh, behind a normal Soviet soldier stood soldiers of the interior forces of the secret services, and so it was so hard. And Stalinism. Uh, even even uh, was uh, cruel to uh, prisoners, for example, or for families of prisoners, because Stalin said every prisoner, uh, every prisoner uh, of the Soviet soldiers did not fight uh, for Russia. He should fight uh, until death. And so a prisoner was a kind of traitor for him. And all the families were treated very bad. And this ended after the Second World War when every prisoner normally came back to, to Russia, he started uh, a life at an, in, a, in a Soviet prison for several times because he, would, he was treated as a traitor. This is very hard and very, you know, very cruel. Uh, even without Hitler, this, uh, this inner Soviet history uh, uh, made it, yeah, it, it's, worth, it's worth of thinking it, I think. It was really very cruel this kind of situation and um, was the invasion of the USSR Hitler wars mistake? Uh, <laughs> the invasion of Russia was Hitler's war. He, he wanted it. This is Hitler's idea to have this war against the Bolshevism, against Stalin, against uh, the Jewish people, Hitler thought that Russia was led by Jewish Bolshevism. This idea was Hitler's idea and uh, uh, yeah, Hitler's men also. And so uh, hit for Hitler himself, it wasn't a fault. It was his war, his war uh, towards world, world power. And uh, so uh, for, for Germans today, the whole war was a mistake. Right? And... Uh, for even for naval officers, uh, uh, German naval officers, they already thought, for example, uh, Dr. Reda, who was uh, head of the German Navy, who thought in 1939 that it's not possible to win a war against a naval power. And he meant uh, Great Britain and then the United States. So Germany in 1941, 1942, led war against Britain against the United States and against Russia. So against two super naval powers and against a super land power. And so uh, this is not, uh, not normal to have a war like this. This is Hitler's idea to have a final war, to have world power perhaps uh, just, uh, just uh, in, in a few years. And so um, a lot of people thought, okay, was there any sense in Hitler's plans? And uh, so, no, it's, it's this idea to, to have this super fight. And when it was clear that Hitler uh, won't uh, win this war, war, this is Hitler's idea of have a super destruction of Germany. And this is even in the last days of the Third Reich, 
where Hitler thought that the, the German people would vanish from the earth and that people uh, in the future would think of the Germans as a kind of vanished master race. And this is, uh, this is really weird, but this is a leader of a state. And there were a lot of people and a lot of military experts who followed him and followed him very, very long. And only a small group of officers tried to kill him. Uh, the majority of the military elite supported him. This is the fact. The Germans have any chance of success? <laughs> I think no. I think no. But uh, we Why? know that uh, we know that they have no success because the war, the war was lost. But I think, uh, as I told you, um, uh, the Germans had this idea, which was um, typical German even from the 19th century. Germany is in the center of Europe. And when there's war, perhaps it was surrounded by nations who wanted to, to win or to can ally against Germany. And this idea, uh, Germany in the middle against its foes, led to a German operational idea to have a quick war with decisive, with decisive operational art, for example. And so uh, it was... Uh, in the war uh, 1870, 1871 against France, uh, within several weeks, they uh, won the war against the Imperial French army at Sedan. But the war lasted longer as they thought, and uh, they knew a long war was very critical for Germany because in a long war, the powers... Uh, uh, outside uh, Europe, perhaps, or uh, at the outskirts of Europe, like Britain as naval superpower, or Russia, or Austria, they could uh, they could regain power and could unite. And so Germany tried to have quick battles, hard uh, hard beating the enemy, and to force a victory in the shortest possible time. And this idea led also to the First World War, where they sought they had a super encirclement in the West, the so-called Schlieffen Plan, which, is, uh, which would lead to a defeat of France in several weeks. And then the mass of the German army would jump on the train and ride to the east and then beat Russia. This is the idea of the First World War, which didn't work. But in the end, and this is what a lot of people knew, in the end, the First World War ended in the east with a German victory. And a lot of people think, okay, perhaps next time it will try. No, but they, they tried it again uh, in 1940, within several days through the Netherlands, through Belgium, within several weeks against France. But then this problem to attack against the naval power, and it ended up at the Channel, and Britain, after the Battle of Britain, was alone, but it was alone standing against Germany. And then Germany thought, okay, we attack Russia, in a way, the Hitler's war, but also this idea, when Germany beats Russia quick, England would, say, would realize that they are alone without allies and would perhaps uh, come to peace, good peace. And on the way to Russia, so to speak, they had this idea, okay, we need in the flank, on the flank, uh, uh, to clear the situation. And so this led to uh, a battle against Yugoslavia, against Greece, uh, helping the Italians, but at last uh, clearing the situation for this final war against Russia. And you see this, this is from one quick victory towards another, but this all ended towards Russia and it ended towards uh, Great Britain. And, and uh, then uh, naturally, it ended against the United States, with, which developed uh, in a very short time to a military superpower from a rather, rather calm uh, or rather minor army during the 1930s up through a world power in, within several weeks, uh, several years, I think. Okay. And about that, do you think, uh, what do you think about what lesson from the World War II can be applied to today's geopolitical situation? 
<laughs> is for a historian. The historian is yeah. uh, normally is deconstructing and reconstructing history. And uh, a lesson, a lesson is uh, no, the, the, the top lesson, I think, is uh, not to wage war if it's not part, if it's not uh, against you. When you are attacked, okay, you are forced to, 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 uh, to fight. But uh, before a nation goes to war, they should try everything to, to, to avoid war because war is uh, has its own uh, laws has its own uh, right uh, its own force and sometimes drives people in direction they they don't even think that uh, this this will happen there. but but uh, i think it's uh, it's useless uh, for for looking for every re recipe for future wars i think it's more this recipe to to hold peace and uh, what this is for all our students who like military history. Um, it's not a problem to like military history, to, to read of battles and operations on strategy. It's, it's interesting and it's, uh, it's very, uh, very good to, to, to sharpen, I think, your brain and to, to think. But the problem is uh, a lot of people think that uh, history repeats in a way but uh, as a historian, I can say, who, who will say that it's a repetition when you don't know exactly what was? Because everything, when we look inside history, you see this is a reconstruction of history from our view of today. So perhaps what we think is not the history, the historical situation, it's not so bad because it's our interest in history and we are posing questions, we are answering our questions, and that we are very fine with it. But you can't say, oh, it's a repetition. But for an historian, it's, it's imp important that you can say when, for example, the politician uses history, that a good historian can say, okay, but this is your interpretation of history, and this is not my interpretation, and uh, the specialist is the historian. He can interpret his theory but um, the politician is free <laughs> to to make make his choice from everywhere and so uh, i think a historian is not every is not a good uh, good advisor for everything i think uh, a politician needs to 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 to, to, to act uh, with his uh, uh, his own impression of the situation and he can use history and we all know parts of it are perhaps true but uh, it's it's a it's a it's a let's uh, it's a tool perhaps it's a tool to get ahead towards a new solution and uh, when there's uh, this will to peace behind it for me it's good anyway you say, yeah, really great words. And for our, our student, it's really a key because if you don't know the history, if you don't read, if you don't watch this kind of topics, of course, again, repeat the same mistake that happened right now. And about some of your publication is the book that National Defense and Militarization, Military and Security Policy for the GDR, German Democratic Republic. Do you think that, or oh, what about that? How militaristic was the GDR? <laughs> to show it. Yeah, of course. Because this is, this is my Phil D. It's a little bit much work, but uh, this, this question is how militaristic a state is. It was a uh, socialist state, East Germany. It was uh, very much under the influence of the Soviet Union, and uh, the the leading the leading politicians of the GDR were politicians which uh, learned their uh, learned their lessons their their ideology ideology after the First World War. For example, Erich Honecker, who was the head of state. He was uh, from a f family, and uh, his father and uh, his uh, was a soldier of the German army, perhaps in the First World War. Uh, he knew 
he knew what happened from from his uh, small town in uh, in uh, Germany, and then he he was uh, during uh, the 1930s he was in Moscow on training under during the Stalin era, and then he returned to Germany to to work secretly for the Socialist Party and uh, was catched and uh, in a German uh, prison up to uh, 1945. And he survived this era. And uh, after this, he, yeah, he, he chose uh, the way of Stalin in a way. And uh, from one German dictatorship, it went into another German dictatorship. And uh, he was uh, the head of the German youth uh, organization and then head of state. And these people uh, weren't, mil weren't soldiers. Uh, the Honecker had a kind of military education in Russia, but he was a more a, a, a socialist political leader. And the militarization of the GDR was not in favor of the military. It was in favor of the Socialist Party. And this is for a lot of people is quite amazing because they think, okay, they are training the people to fight uh, against the NATO. But in fact, it was a project of the educational ministry. And uh, for the military, it was uh, sometimes useless work to support this because they had to uh, organize training for the children and so, and they, they didn't like very much. Perhaps they thought they could uh, find uh, future soldiers among the youth, but this didn't work out. In fact, it was a lot of work for the military and it paid more for the Socialist Party because they wanted to create this uh, socialist citizen who likes to defend the GDR. And this is his idea of militarization. That I want to share with all our audience and the student is about at the first of this episode, you show other book that you create. Can you yes. share with all our audience about this book? We are developing books for the education of soldiers. We normally think of uh, what uh, the normal soldier has uh, when he enters the army, he comes from a civilian school. And so we have this uh, basic uh, education at school, but what it's uh, not normal in German schools is have military history. So they know something about First World War, Second World War, but not about operational art, about how battles were and uh, how, how wars were led uh, from Napoleon up to, to now. And so we had this idea uh, to, to give to our teachers and to our officers' schools books that are uh, like, like a school book, but uh, even also a book when the officers finish his officer school, he can take the book and he is, when he finishes his course, he is a future teacher in some ways, because when he is in his normally company or battalion, the officers normally are teaching in a smaller scale uh, politics or sometimes history in Germany. And so they have this book, which is like a normal school book, but we have also uh, an online part of this book, which is uh, organized together with a, uh, like, like a German school book, um, uh, uh, school book, it's uh, paper and it's online, which is uh, state of the art in Germany today. So, um, on the other side, we have a uh, online-based uh, uh, teaching material, which is um, uh, f uh, normally for uh, in an intranet, not internet, but intranet, which is only uh, possible to, uh, to get when you're inside the army. And so we are uh, giving, uh, we, are, we are preparing teaching material. For example, this year's teaching material is about the Cold War, and it's about the massacre of the Wehrmacht in the Second World War, which is the massacre of Oradour-sur-Glane in 1944, when the German SS unit killed the whole population of a village and burned the village, which is today in France a memorial site. And so we change year to year 
our uh, uh, themes for military history and uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Defense gives orders to all German military units to have this for this year, next year, perhaps we have uh, 2023. Perhaps we are dealing of the year of, 2000, uh, of 1923 when, the, when we have a great inflation in, in Germany. Uh, we had uh, an in, a national crisis, a, a kind of coup d'etat and something. And so perhaps we will prepare this. And even for this year, for example, we prepare a book for the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And uh, with it, also a kind of uh, book where you can uh, listen, you can, a kind of podcast where you can listen to it. And we, we, have, we try to get, uh, uh, try to find a lot of channels to get to the soldier's mind in a way with books, with uh, news, with kind of journals, with podcasts, with internet lessons. Uh, it's uh, yeah, like we think we, we should get it, it should do it. But final, Misat, could you tell to all our students about the history and this event that should not be repeated today? Yeah. Message to all students is ask questions, okay? Uh, it is uh, so, much, uh, so much fun in history to, to ask uh, questions uh, toward problems you think uh, they should be solved uh, as historians. And so, um, when, uh, when you start uh, dealing with the history, perhaps start writing down questions. And uh, then you see what, what perhaps what drives you to, to, to what, what drives you to, to history, towards history. And um, um, as I said, it's, uh, it's not a problem to like military history. But it's, uh, it's about dying and it's about suffering. It's really hard. And uh, a lot of people, oh, they like, for example, like tanks, like battles and like heroes of the war. But uh, war is every, uh, every time war is about suffering and it's about dying. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of, uh, some people think, okay, it, it brings out the best of the people, but in a way it brings out the worst of the people also. And, um, but um, perhaps uh, as a message, what, what we can learn, uh, especially from the Second World War is uh, how, how, how strong democracies can be. Because uh, in the wake of the, in the beginning of the Second World War, uh, the democracies were uh, fr from the, the viewpoint of, uh, of Russia, or of Germany, of Italy, or perhaps Japan, democracies were weak in a way. They thought democracy is weak, and we had this idea of appeasement. Where, uh, but but in a way, uh, democracies like perhaps peace more than war in a way. But when the war started, and this is what is the lesson. Uh, democracies develop in a very fierce way. When, when we say how this, uh, even the free economy could develop into a, a, a war economy like the uh, United States, um, this, uh, no one thought that within some, several, you know, several years, this, uh, this, fabri this fabrication of tanks, of ships, of uh, airplanes, which, which happened in the free world even uh, outside Germany, this, this led to a victory uh, over dictators. And uh, I think dictators have, not, had, have nothing, nothing to offer. And democracies uh, are, uh, when, when a war starts, uh, the citizens realize what they have in a democracy. And so the morale question is, I think, decisive. And moral, a moral question is worth more in a democracy than this fear uh, against a dictator like Stalin or Hitler. Well, I think this is a, a good message from history, perhaps. Really good and amazing final message for all our audience. And we have reached 
the end of this incredible and interesting section of INISECAS, but accompanied by a great expert in military background. So thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Heine Brockenman, for once again being a part of these interviews and provide all our audience with a comprehensive content on this magnificent trajectory as a military expert. Thank you.